Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, again, there's more people here now that I haven't said it, but good morning, church. Awesome. And again, I want to make sure that you guys all know that tonight starts our summer movie nights. So we are watching Jesus Revolution out on our football field. Be there at seven o'clock for hot dogs, chips, and water. And then right as it about, about gets dark, about eight ten, we start the movie. So we just encourage you guys all to uh, come and show up and uh, check it out. It's going to be a good time. Also, praise the Lord for air conditioning because uh, that is awesome. For those of you that have been here long enough, you know what it would be like right now with the swamp coolers that we used to have during this time. The eight o'clock service already kind of heated it up. And so we turned it down even a little bit more, but man, you used to walk in this room and like everyone's bulletins instantly turned into like, some of you became such good fan makers. It was, it was like, you could have sold them on Shark Tank. You know, it was crazy. You're double fanning, you know, it was fantastic. But if you have your Bibles, uh, let's open them up to the book of Acts. The book of Acts chapter 24 is where we're going to be. And if you're new here, uh, this is how we do things. We go through the entire scriptures. And uh, so we were in Acts 23 last time I was up here. Pastor Gerald uh, taught, uh, he's, he's, he's our traveling pastor. It was nice to have him come visit us. Uh, but no, he taught uh, out of 1 John last week. Uh, it was so awesome. And so if you didn't get a chance to listen to that, you can go online and listen to all of his services or my services uh, uh, um, on YouTube or on our Facebook, and uh, they're all there. But before that, we were in Acts 23, so now we're going to be in Acts 24. And what we've been doing in the book of Acts is we've been following around Paul on his missionary journeys, and also, too, just kind of as he's going around preaching the gospel. Well, we saw that Paul was, uh, it's called, bound in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. There was many people that warned him about what was waiting for him in Jerusalem. There was a prophet that came and warned him about what was waiting for him there. All of these warnings that were happening uh, actually came to fruition. They were 100% accurate. When he got to Jerusalem, it was one hard time after another hard time after another hard time after another hard time. But you know what? Even through all the hard times, God was in complete control of what Paul was doing. Paul's desire in his life to share the gospel was so much greater than any discomfort within his life. He wanted to preach Jesus at any cost. And so this is what he was doing. And with every single time, a difficult time that Paul faced, whether it was him being beaten, him being arrested by the Romans, him being persecuted, him being thrown into prison, each and every one of those times and those difficult times was just a greater opportunity to share the gospel with people that are actually listening. You know, it seems like whenever someone starts to share a story about tragedy in their life, everyone kind of listens to them, let alone when they're going through it. You know, like a lot of you that listen to country music and you're big fans of it, you understand about tragedy and music, right? You know, you play country music in reverse, you get your dog back, your wife back, you know, you sober up, all those things. Um, some of you are country music fans that aren't laughing, and for that I say sorry. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, the truth is this, when someone is, is in a bad spot, people like to watch and they like to hear what they have to say. And for Paul, he just used it as opportunities to share the gospel. They were the greatest opportunities of his life when he was going through the hardest times of his life. His desire was to see people and the Jews come to know Jesus. And thinking about the results of what God calls us to do, you know, it didn't turn out the way I'm sure he would really want it to turn out. You know, having people beat you and throw you in prison, that's never what you expect or want to happen. But instead of focusing on the result, you have to focus on what God's called you to do. That's with anyone's life. I don't care if the Lord's called you to teach a Bible study and there's only two people that ever show up to your Bible study. Be faithful to preach to those two people, amen? God's in charge of the result. We're not in charge of it. We're just called to be faithful. And while sitting in prison, probably with all those things I just mentioned on his mind, you know, just, oh man, this is not the way I wanted it to turn out. I didn't want people to get upset. I didn't want to be divisive. That was never my heart. We saw that Jesus actually appears to Paul and stands with him in prison and told him, be of good cheer. Do you know why Jesus said, be of good cheer? Because Paul needed cheering up. Be of good cheer, Paul. For as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you will also do and bear witness at me in Rome. 
There's still more for you to do, Paul. Cheer up. I'm still using you. I am with you. I see what you're going through. Now get up. We got more to do. God was reminding him that even in the darkest times of his life, even in the most difficult times in his life, you want to serve me? I'm in complete control. I'm even in complete control of the chaos. And boy, chaos continued and continued in his life as well because almost immediately after Jesus spoke this to him, there was then a conspiracy to take the life of Paul. There was more than 40 people that made the stupidest pact that anyone has ever heard of in their life. They said, we will not eat anything until we have killed Paul. Listen, you could not make me do anything like that to make a promise to anything. You know, I I will not eat ever again until I do this. Because here's the thing, unfortunately for them, they're going to go hungry if they follow through with their pact. We won't eat anything until he's dead. Well, he's still alive two years later. So... They're probably dead if they decided to do that. But my guess is that they broke the pact and decided to eat a cracker or two. I don't know. But a a young man stood against the mob. That's the interesting part. They made a pact. There was chaos in his life. And a young man stood up against the mob. And one man's actions actually saved the life of Paul. One young man saying, I'm not going to go along with the crowd. I'm not going to go along with the conspiracy. I'm not going to go along with all this. I'm going to stand for what is right. And where we left off was God using what the enemy was trying to do to to defeat Paul and the willingness of one man to stand for the Lord to actually deliver Paul to Rome to declare the gospel. And now he was being escorted by a set of bodyguards. Verse 23 of chapter 23 said, Prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. That's exactly where we left off. So he brought him to Felix the governor. That's where we saw Felix is now waiting for these accusers to come and accuse Paul of whatever case they have against him. Uh, We'll pick up in chapter 24. But before we do that, should we go to the Lord in prayer? Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful to be here uh, before your presence, Lord. Lord, we just know that as we're gathered, Lord, you are here. And so, Lord, we just um, want to say, that, Lord, would you get us out of the way? Lord, would you get our flesh out of the way or what we think needs to happen or, or whatever else, Lord God. We just, we just want that gone and we just want your Holy Spirit ministering to each and every one of us. Lord, we know that as we're here to grow with you, Lord God, we know the enemy is putting in overtime as he's trying to distract people and he's trying to get them focused off of you completely. But Lord, we just pray you just bind the enemy and just release your Holy Spirit. Lord, we just need to hear from you today. There's people in this room that are suffering. There's people in this room that are hurting. There's people in this room that need convicting. There's all these things that need to be done. I cannot do, but Lord, your Holy Spirit can do it and does do it every single week that we are gathered. So Lord, you do the work. You receive the glory. It is all because of you. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Let's look at the first four verses as we're used to doing here at Joshua Springs as we break down the chapter says in chapter 24, starting in verse 1. Now after five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and a certain order named Tertullus. These gave gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusations, saying, Seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight, We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg to you to hear, by your courtesy, a few words from us. So here we have it. Paul has went through the night. He has been escorted because there was people that wanted to kill him. He's been in Caesarea waiting for his accusers. And now five days later, these accusers show up. Who's a part of these people? Who's who's the party that's showing up to accuse Paul? Well, it's Ananias, the high priest. You got some of his religious friends and a guy named Tortillas, Tortillas or Tortillas, whatever, however you pronounce that. 
And he is a well-spoken kiss-up or orator. Like, uh, he's, he's basically, he's a kiss-up orator. He's a, he's a person that is just a lawyer. He, they're, they're bringing in this person. And I find it so interesting. As these group of people show up, do you realize they had to travel five days and 60 miles to accuse Paul of something they knew that they had no evidence for? And I think more than that, they're upset that they didn't get to kill him themselves. And so now they're looking for a way to legally kill someone that they know is innocent of what they're charging him for. That is terrifying to me. That is called a conscience seared by sin. They, every single step that they walked to get to this place, they were more confident that they were going to continue with their sin than they were convicted. Church, it's, it's always interesting when we continue on this life of sin that our conscience is so seared that we don't even realize where we are going or what is happening. And for them, there was no conviction. They're just attempting to murder a person on false charges. At the end of your 60-mile journey, they were more determined than they were when they left. If that is the case in your life, if you can willingly drive to go sin, if you can really go, go hours out of your way and you're more determined to sin, who are you listening to? The Holy Spirit's what convicts us of sin and draws us to Jesus, amen? But if we're willing to walk five days or drive two hours or four hours to Las Vegas to sin, without listening to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, who are we listening to? Because the Lord's not leading you to do those things. And I, and I kind of joked around about the beginning about this tortulas or tortillas or being with them. I joked around about that, but he's this big gun lawyer that they're bringing with them to speak to the governor because they know they have false accusations. And I joked around about being a kiss up because he was a schmoozer. He starts off the first four verses doing nothing but talking this man up. He doesn't really care about Rome. He doesn't really care about the people he's talking to. You know what he's doing? He's using flattery in order to sway the outcome into his favor. The Bible talks about people that empty flatter someone else. The, the Bible talks about people that just want to sweeten you up so they can get what they need. Proverbs 29.5 tells us, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. Proverbs 26, 20, uh, chapter 26, 24 through 28 says, he who hates disguises it with his lips. He lays deceit within himself. When he speaks kindly, do not believe him. For there are seven abominations in his heart. Through his hatred, it is covered by deceit. His wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone will have it roll back onto him. A lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it, and a flattering mouth will work ruin. I've seen these people within my own life. I'm always very nervous when someone comes up and talks to me too much. Listen, I know who I am, okay? So someone, oh, you're the best person ever. You're a best teacher. I'm subpar at best. But I'm here to tell you, I, I, when, then, they, then they come in with a question. Oh, but we, let me ask you, you guys hiring? Oh, you know, I don't, you guys, this church is just so great and everything is so, can I have all of this or can I have, it, they always try to come in and, and to sweet talk the deal and they, they try to tickle your ego. They try to tickle your pride. Be very careful of someone that before they've asked you of anything, they flatter you. Who in this room has children? They are professionals. My daughter will come up to me and go, I love you, Dada. I love you. She does this thing where I, I okay, I trusted her to brush her teeth for the first couple of years of her life. Bad idea. Bad idea. Don't, you all need to brush your kids' teeth. Don't let them, don't trust them. They don't do it right. So I had, I'm now brushing my daughter's teeth and she does this thing where she'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I like to kiss her on the cheek. She was the one that was right here. If you're wondering why I'm kissing a child that came to the stage, it was my daughter, okay? Don't be weirded out. So, so my daughter was right here, but when I brush her teeth, instead of kissing me, she'll, she'll, she'll go like this on my cheek. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> and then she'll go, I love you, Dada. 
can I have a snack before bed? And you're like, I just brushed your teeth. She's like, I love you, Dada. I'm like, you're perfect. Have a snack. You know, like, like you know, because they're perfect at it. There's people in your life that know that they can say certain words to you before they ask anything to you so that they can get what they want. Your children are criminals, verses five through six. They're hardened, hardened criminals. They know what they're doing to you. How does a dad say no to his little girl? Like how? Dada, I love you. Will you take me to a movie? No, I'm not taking the movie, but I love you, Dada. Okay, we're going to a movie, I guess. Five through six. For we found this man, this is their accusations, I love it. We found this man to be a plague. He's a creator of dissension among the Jews throughout the world. He's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple and we seized him and we wanted to judge him according to our law. Uh, The first thing they they accused him from is the only one that they actually believe truthful in their heart. The other ones they know they have no evidence of. The, the, The true thing is they think he's a plague. That's the only thing. Basically, we don't like him. He is the worst. Let's kill him. That's, but unfortunately for them, uh, that's not enough to kill someone today. Otherwise, there'd be a lot of dead people in this room, right? There'd be a lot of people, yeah, I just don't like them. So they need to, they need to die. That's, that was their whole justification. So what they had to do is they had to come up with accusations that fit according to the law and try to kind of fit the law around what their heart was. And really their heart was, I just don't like them. So the three things they came up with was political treason, religious heresy, and temple desecration is what we're going to read. Those are the ones that they try to get Paul on. Basically, that, that we're going to accuse Paul that he is stirring up riots throughout the Roman Empire that he is speaking against the law of Moses. He's told people not to circumcise their kids. He's working up Jews all over the world. At that one, you know, Paul's got to kind of grin. You know, like, all over the world, you say? Man, that ministry is really working, you know? Like, the, the gospel has gone out. And yes, that is true. The Jews are worked up all over the world because Jesus is the Messiah, and they didn't accept him as their Messiah. So the fact that they're like, He's working up Jews all over the world. It's just the effectiveness of the gospel, amen? And this one that I think is great, they say, he's a ringleader. He's a ringleader of the Nazarenes. Now, Paul has never called himself a Nazarene. In fact, you're going to see that Paul calls himself uh, um, a follower of the way. Okay, so speaking of Christians, this is is what they used, uh, you know, to, to talk about, hey, this is, this is a Christian, this is a Nazarene. And what they were trying to do is associate uh, Jesus, uh, not Jesus, Paul with Jesus of Nazareth. That word Nazareth to people instantly brought up thoughts. So he's like, yeah, he's, he's a ringleader of the Nazarene. The poor, the despised. Oh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's gonna lead the misfits. He's gonna lead the miscreants. That's his group. Let's go ahead and start with that. That's what they're accusing him of. It would be like the equivalent of how down the hill used to view up to the hill, right? How Palm Desert and Palm Springs, all those areas. And you're like, oh, they never did that. Listen, when I moved here 14 years ago before the big boom of Airbnbs and tourism happened here. I remember going to Costco. Yes, it's a Costco story, not a Walmart story. I went to Costco and as I walked in, uh, they scanned my stuff and I said something along the lines of like, yeah, I have to you know, drive 45 minutes home so I don't know if it's gonna melt. And they go, where do you live? And I said, I live in Yucca Valley. And they go, <laughs> and I'm like, Duh. they're like, Duh. I was like super confused on what was going on and why there's a, Duh. you know, it, it, the whole world caught up with it about seven, eight years later. And they're like, oh, this desert's pretty cool, man. I like the high desert. And now, now, they all, now they all know about it. But it would be like someone accusing you about 14 years ago when you're down the hill and before they started, you're like some country club or something and you joined a country club and you're trying just to golf. I don't golf, but you're trying to golf and they're like, he did something wrong. And they're like, no, he didn't. And he's like, he's from Yucca Valley, right? That's what they were trying to do because Yucca Valley is associated with a certain type of people. What I think Yucca Valley is associated with is salt of the earth, hardworking, lower income people than the rest of California. And those are my kind of people. They're also known for meth heads and Christians. So you got to choose which way you're sitting on that one. (laughs) So you laugh because you know it's true. You're like, 
Yeah, I'm here at church. I'm definitely, yeah. So anyways, meth heads and Christians, that's what we're also known for. It's a funny story. Pastor Gerald, and you're like, how are we known as Christians? I'll tell you. First of all, we were, by, by some uh, publication down, down in the lower desert, someone sent us a picture of it. It called the high desert, the Bible belt of San Bernardino. So I was like, hey, we're a part of that Bible belt. Yes and amen. We'll take that. But Pastor Gerald walked into a local business here and, you know, support local business. Amen? Support those local businesses. So Gerald walked in and uh, he walked in and he's walking and he hears Joshua Springs. And, and he's with my mom and he's with my daughter and a couple other people. He walks in and, and then they go, yeah, some things you got to know about this place. There's a church up there that just runs this place. There's a guy named Pastor Gerald. He's just like, yeah, he's, he's up there. They got a big old church. There's too much light pollution. And they're just going on and on and on. Pastor Gerald, you know, and like there's a lot of Christians or whatever. And Gerald's just walking around the store, in the store, as the guy is talking about him. Everyone's listening. So Gerald buys a bunch of stuff. He grabs stuff, walks up, sets it on the counter. And they're like, hey, how are you doing? You from this area? He's like, hi, my name is Pastor Gerald. I'm from Joshua Springs. <laughs> the guy's face was like, he's like, we'd love to invite you out to church. You have a lovely business here. God bless you. And the guy just, uh, you know, but, but that's the thing is we're known for, for Christians up here. It's, it's the same way for, you know, the Nazarenes. They were known by something. They were viewed as a less than than the rest of the people. Another accusation that they brought up here is supposedly, it even says supposedly in the scripture, bringing a Gentile into the Jewish temple courts. This has no proof. This has no charge. There's no validation to this. And, and looking at the way that Paul lived versus the way that all these detractors talked about him, it reminded me that people will and can say about you whatever they want. Is that not true? I will tell you that it is true if you do not believe me. As you can see, people can say about Gerald whatever they want. You can't control what people are going to say. And here's the thing. If standing for righteousness and preaching the gospel leads the world and other religious people to think ill about you, well, then just remember that you're in good company. Jesus said, if the, you know, you, the world would love you if you were one of his own, but I have chosen you out of the world. So the world hates you. Paul is dealing with the same thing. These religious leaders hated him. And so if you ever feel like, oh man, I'm on the outside because I love Jesus so much, you're in good company. You're exactly where you should be. Amen? Verses six through nine, again, there's a part I wanted to focus on on six, so we'll reread it. It said, even tried, that he even tried to profane the temple. And when we seized him, we just wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came in, took him with great violence, took him out of our hands, commanded his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain that all these things in which we accuse to him. And then verse 9 says, And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. Oh, guys, religious hypocrisy at its finest. This is just religious hypocrisy. There's no context to this in what we've been reading throughout the book of Acts. They're making it sound like they were harmless. Listen, we were just one day, we were at the temple and there was Paul. And we were like, hey, there's some people that have disagreements with you. Can we just have you come before us in our courts and, and, and just, just be judged according to the law? Oh, then Lysias, the Roman, he came by and he violently took him from us. You know, you know why, you know why Lysias came is because you were trying to kill him. You weren't trying to try him. Fair trial was not what you had in mind. In fact, the scripture defines it as you were trying to pull him to pieces. I don't even know what that means, but it doesn't sound comfortable. These people are somehow, you know, acting innocent when they're the ones that were consenting to the conspiracy to kill Paul as he was coming to be trialed, as he was coming to go through the trial. No evidence of it all. No evidence of what's going on in this trial is offered. So here's what they're doing. They're just trying to downplay Paul. They're just trying to downplay what's going on. And they're just hoping that they would be in a better light than Paul when Paul could speak. And I love his weird like little assenting friends that are over here because there's no, there's no witnesses. So it's Ananias and a bunch of other religious buddies. And they're like, yeah, yeah, he totally did it. We saw it all. It was, it was, 
this is the worst, man. Paul's a plague, man. Like that, that's, that's what they were doing. I don't know why they sound like that, but, but they did in my mind. They did in my mind. So 10 through 13 as we continue on. Paul gets to speak. Let's see what he says. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded towards him to speak, he answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor was I inciting a crowd, either in the synagogue or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they are now trying to accuse me. Paul is an educated man. Paul was waiting for his time. That's one thing that I like. Sometimes we just need to shut our mouths until it's our turn to speak. Like Paul's getting selfless accusation. I mean, over and over and over, all these accusations against him, which he did not do. And yet he didn't sit there going, oh, I did not do that. That is not true. Instead, it waited for his time. He got the head nod. Go ahead and speak. And you know what? He spoke. And he's an educated person, but there's also a promise in Matthew 10, 17 through 21 that Jesus said to his disciples. He said, beware of men for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. Now listen, you will be brought before governors. This is exactly what's happening to Paul. You will be brought before governors and kings for my name's sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. This is exactly what you're going to see Paul doing as he's going through this life presently. We understand that it, no matter how educated or uneducated Paul is, which he is educated, when he's put on the spot for the name of Christ, he could expect the Lord to show up and speak through him. It goes for all of us. As you follow the Lord in your life, he is going to equip you to do what you need to do. Sometimes it just requires us to open our mouths. Sometimes we're like, oh, what am I ever going to say? What am I gonna ever do? Listen, you, if you've been pouring the word of God into your life, the Holy Spirit goes through that Rolodex and just starts pulling things out when it's time to speak. Do not worry what you're going to speak to your friends. Do not worry of how you're going to say it. If the Lord's called you to go somewhere, if the Lord's called you to say it, trust in him and have an expectancy that he will speak through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Call, God didn't bring Paul this far to begin to abandon him now. And I'm here to tell you that God hasn't brought you to where you are at now to abandon you. And Paul is excited to share. Paul is filled with the Spirit. Paul knows his innocence. And he says, I cheerfully answer for myself. And he begins to attack one big hole in their argument. The first hole that he picks out is sedition. And what sedition is defined as is a person who conducts, uh, uses conduct or speech to incite people to rebel against authority. So they're using conduct or speech to rebel against authority. In this case, it would be against the Roman government. So why is he using this? Why is he going after this one? Because this is the one that Rome could kill you for. Rome could kill you for being a dissenter, for being one causing division against the government. And one thing that I love about Paul, he's practical. I, I don't get anything out of someone trying to sound smart. I am the most practical and, and like, talk to me really stupid or I won't get it. Because here's the thing, I, I can't leave a message that someone speaks and go, man, that guy sounded smart. I have no idea what he said. I would much rather be the guy that's like, ah, oh, that guy seemed pretty average, but you know what the Lord said to me? And so for him, it was very practical. It was very normal. And he says this, the truth is this, Felix, I've only been here for 12 days. I've been here for 12 days. That isn't much time to overthrow a government, is it? It's not much time to start a revolution, you know? 12 days? What am I supposed to do in 12 days? It reminds me of the defense that Peter used when trying to explain the Holy Spirit and how they weren't drunk and how they were just speaking in tongues. He's like, listen, these people aren't drunk. I promise you, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. No one's drunk at 9 a.m. Come on, you got a big problem if you're drunk at 9 a.m. You know, that, that, it's just very practical that people can understand. And Paul's defense, which, which we're gonna point out again and again and again, essentially is this, is if I was this person they're accusing me of, 
and I was causing all these problems. There should be hundreds, no, thousands of witnesses here with them. And yet there's no one except the accusers and a bunch of religious old men. No one found me disputing in the temple. They're lying, and that's why there's no one here. No one found me inciting a crowd anywhere, and that's why there's no one here. It's just not true. So I'm here to tell you again, you cannot personally control what people are going to say about you, but you can live in a way that none of their accusations will stick to you. People can say whatever they want, and people will say whatever they want, but if you're following Jesus, it's just going to fall off, right? That's why we need to follow Jesus is so those accusations don't stick to us. Verses 14 through 16. So he denies these things, but he's going to go ahead and uh, confess to something. He says, this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. Verse 16, this being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. So Paul doesn't even entertain their whole, he's a sect of the Nazarene. He's like, listen, what they said I was, I, I'm a follower of the way. Again, the term for being a Christian before the term Christian was, was coined. I like the way better because then I could be like, hey, give your life to Jesus. This is the way. That would be fantastic. But we don't go by the way anymore. We're known as Christians. But Paul, no one watches Star Wars? No one? Okay. All right, no one got it. That's fine. So you know some of my jokes, I throw out so many that like eventually someone's gonna laugh at one. You just kind of put them all out there and see what happens. But that one fell pretty, pretty low and it's still falling pretty low. So, I don't know, I thought it was funny. So anyways, <laughs> but what does Paul do here? What does Paul do? He's using th this opportunity to put the focus back on the way. He uses this opportunity to put the focus back on Jesus Christ. He's, he's directly refuting their claim of heresy. See. There had to be an approved religion of the Romans for you to carry on your religious practices. Unauthorized religions could not happen. And so he's like, I, I believe basically what they believe. Nothing he said was a lie about what he believed. I worship the God of my fathers. My hope is in God and the resurrection of the dead. I still believe in the prophets. I still believe in the law. But what Paul believes about those things is that they've already been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Amen. Matthew 5, 17 through 18, Jesus said, do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but I came to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till it's fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled the law. Paul believes in a completed story. And then Paul begins to say this, that being so, because I believe God, because I believe in a resurrection of the dead, because I believe in my hope, because I believe in all these things, I, 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 I myself strive to have conscience without offense towards God and men. I myself have the intention to, to never have all these things happening. In the scenario that he was living in, this is none of the stuff he wanted to happen. He didn't want people to hate him. He loved the people he was talking to. He didn't want to be divisive. He didn't want to be abused. He didn't want to be thrown into prison. That's all in the way that they were acting. Paul will write something later in Romans 12, 18, where he says, if it is possible, that is important. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, you can't control what they're going to do. You can only control what you're going to do in every situation, right? So if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Sometimes it just doesn't work as we're seeing here. But for Paul, his conscience was clear. He humbled himself. He did the purification ceremony. His intention that people would come know God. He was, he was peaceful as he could be. The rest is on them. This is such an important aspect that we apply to our lives today. That where our heart and our conscience are, let them be clear when we're ministering to others. Because when we minister to others, we can have a heart in two different spots. Number one, we can have a heart that truthfully wants to see someone come to know the Lord. We, we can want to see them delivered from chains and bondage and receive freedom and, 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 and salvation. 
But there's also people that, that, that do crazy things like just yell about how people are going to hell and they're bringing a spectacle onto themselves. And, and you gotta ask yourself, are you doing it to see people saved or are you doing it to make a spectacle and to elevate yourself above your common people? This is what drives me crazy. When you are elevated above Jesus Christ, those people there say you're gonna burn in hell never tells them about Jesus. And so they instantly shut the door. I want to tell you that you're a sinner and that Jesus can save you regardless of the sin that you have done. He's going to prove why he came there. He's going to prove that he's in good conscience. In verses 17 through 21, he said, listen, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to this nation in the midst of which some Jews from Asia, they found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with a tumult. I wasn't with a whole bunch of people. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me or else let those who are here themselves say if they have found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before that council, unless it is the one that states, uh, the statement which cries out, standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. Now, remember when I told you that the Sadducees and the Pharisees got in a big argument over the resurrection of the dead? Remember that? One of them believe it, one of them don't. And he's the one that said it. It almost seems like he's regretting saying it here. Let them say anything against me except for that one time. He's not perfect. He's willing to admit when he messed up. But Paul's intention was to deliver blessings. He's like, I even came back to this place to bring alms, to bring offerings to your struggling people here in Jerusalem. I've been gathering it from Gentile churches. You can read about that. He did a GoFundMe, you know, in Galatians 2.10. Romans 15.26 says, it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. He's going around telling people, hey, donate to the bucket. These people need help. These people need a lot of help. 2 Corinthians 8, 8 through 11, he says, I speak not by a commandment, but I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And in this, in this I give advice. It is to your advantage, not only to, to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you must also complete in the doing of it that as there was a readiness and a desire to do it, so there also may be in the completion of what you have. He was saying, hey, listen, I know you desire to give to Jerusalem. Let's, let's get it going. There is a blessing in it for you. All those verses show how much of a heart he had to be in the right place. And Paul's like, it was no problem until one day someone begins shouting out of nowhere. They begin shouting just crazy things. Shouldn't those people be on trial? And literally not one of them that accused me that caused this whole issue is here. Because remember he had his purification ceremony a couple weeks ago and, 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 and then these people just from, these Jews from Asia said, men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law in this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and he has defiled this holy place. He's going, shouldn't they be examined? You want to know why they weren't examined? Because they were the ones starting the violence and the riots. And if they showed up before Felix, he would know better and they would be the ones with their heads on the chopping block. That's why there's no one there to accuse Paul. There was a reason these men did not come because they knew that they could not be defended by the truth. The beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit is this. The Holy Spirit speaking through Paul, all it's doing is pulling from the truth. The Holy Spirit is not going to pull a lie out of its playbook. As Christians, we should never have to think about what we're going to say when we're confronted on something. We just recite the truth. As Christians, we should never have to get together with one another and say, let's get our story straight before they arrive. Because the truth defends a believer. We should allow the truth to speak for itself. Christians shouldn't be afraid of the truth. The truth should be a friend in the life of a believer, not the accuser. And so all he did was spoke the truth. They're not here. They're liars. 22 through 23. 
But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and he said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for, to provide for or to visit him. So it said that Felix has a little bit more accurately understood the way a little bit more. But here's some interesting facts about Felix that you might not, want, not, not have already known. Drusilla is, going to, is his wife. We're going to know that in the next verse. It's going to say that she's Jewish. That's how it explains her. She was the great-granddaughter of Herod the Great. And if you don't know great, uh, Herod the Great, he was the one that tried to kill Jesus as a baby. Um, he, <laughs> Drusilla was also the great-niece of Herod, uh, the one who killed John the Baptist. And her father was the man who killed uh, the apostle James. So had him put to death. So if you thought you had some drama in your family line... Yeah, not, not at all. This is way worse. But another thing about Felix at this time, he had been a governor for six years over Judea and Samaria. So he had been a governor and he had ran into the, the way many a times. He had ran into these Christians many of times. And, and, and in, in speaking to Paul, he even understands it more. These people are trying to j just deflect everything, not telling the truth. Paul is just standing up for the truth. And one thing that he knows about the way is they actually are pretty peaceful people. And so he sees these religious people getting all mad. They're not going around starting riots. And then the ending of that chapter, I mean, any of this chapter is actually really hilarious because the last chapter we ended with Lysias sending Paul to Governor Felix, did we not? I told you, he had all these troops that sent him to Felix because he didn't want to deal with it. So he wrote him a letter, said, good day, have fun with Paul. I don't want to deal with this. And now we're ending with Governor Felix saying, I'm not going to make a decision until Lysias comes here. If that is not the government working at full capacity, I don't know what is, right? No one knowing what they're really doing. It's working just like our government, you know? It's just how it works. But, but waiting for Lysias was just a simple way that, hey, let's delay, delay this trial. Well, I'll wait for him to come out. Whenever he comes out, I'll make the decision. Why would he do that? Well, he knows that Paul is innocent, but he also knew if he let him go, then he would be identifying himself with the way and that that wouldn't be a good po political move. So like a good politician, he remains neutral as much as possible. And you ever wonder how you, you're like, well, it doesn't say that he was innocent. No, no one who you think is guilty, when you throw him in prison, you go, hey, let him have liberty while they're in there, okay? That's what he says about Paul. Let him have liberty. Let his friends come by. They can hang out and have a sleepover, you know? Yeah, they, they let, him, let him order out some food and provide for his needs. That is not at all what you would have done if you thought this man was guilty. But he knew he was innocent, but he also didn't want to take a stand for anything. Look at verses 24 through 27. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about the righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid, and he answered, okay, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I'll, I'll give you a call. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul, that he might release him. He doesn't, this is, you guys, he would rather be like, yeah, they bribed me. They gave me good ransom. That's why I let him go, not because I'm siding with him. They, he literally wants someone to bribe him so he could be caught on that instead of saying that, yeah, I support Paul's decision. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. And then listen, after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix and Felix wanting to do the Jews a favor because of politics, left Paul bound for two, over two years he's been in prison over charges that were not real? Why does this happen to a man that is a good man like Paul? I'll tell you, do you realize what's really going on here? Yes, Paul is in prison. Yes, he's being tried. But there's something so much deeper happening here that oftentimes in our life isn't revealed to us later on in life. You know what this was? This was Jesus reaching out to Felix the governor personally. More than prison, 
For two years, Felix would come and talk to him about these different things, about the way and Jesus and salvation and judgment and all these things. And you know why he could do that is because Paul had a willing heart to say, Lord, wherever you send me, I will go. If it is in chains, I will go. Here I am, Lord, send me, you be glorified. And what that manifested to was him in prison speaking to the governor of Rome. The chains and the trials and the tribulations were only a vessel for Jesus to preach to a man that would be otherwise unreachable by the common person. Paul spoke one-on-one with him time and time again about his faith in Christ, reasoned with him on righteousness, self-control, I love that one, self-control and the judgment to come. And what happened with Felix, it caused him to be afraid. You, you say judgment? Whoa! There's a coming judgment? Having the reminder of judgment, having a reminder that God sees everything hit a little bit too close to Felix. More fun facts about Felix if you didn't know. He's on his third wife. His first wife was the granddaughter of Mark Antony and Cleopatra, who he divorced. The second wife was his princess, uh, was a princess who also he divorced. And Drusilla was a wife of another man who he had taken from the king of Emesa in Syria. And Paul begins to deliver a sermon about self-control. Paul begins to preach to him about faith in Christ, righteousness, self-control, and then judgment. Do you think Paul knew who he was talking to? Oh, for sure. Paul knows that story. I love that Paul faithfully spoke what God had him to say. That Paul didn't water down the gospel and say, any way you're living is just fine. You know, God doesn't care about righteousness or doesn't care about any of that stuff. Like churches all over the world are doing today. There's churches filled with people not getting any truth, but they feel better about themselves. They feel like they've guarded themselves from judgment because they walked into the building. This building is nothing except for the place that the church gathers. I am nothing but a conduit of the Holy Spirit to speak to his people through the word of God. I am nothing. I have no qualifications. Some of you guys are like, amen. Yeah, I don't. And it seems like today people are okay with you talking about sin. People are okay with you talking about sin. People are okay with you talking about the gospel as long as that sin isn't touching close to home for them. Paul says, this is sin that you're living in your life and you need Jesus and self-control and righteousness, but you need salvation to do those things. The gospel is an offensive thing to preach to the world. You know why? Because it's telling people that there is a judgment. It's telling people that the way they are living is not right, that we were all born sinners. It is offensive to our flesh. It is a reminder that you need saving, but that is what the gospel is all about. It's about God's power to change our lives through a new life and a new faith in Jesus Christ. He can change your life that once was destined for death to life by confessing and believing and turning from your sins. Some of you were sinners. All of you were sinners. You read the scripture, some of you were sodomites and homosexuals and adulterers and idolaters. It's a big long list, as were some of you, but you've been washed. We were sinners, we're all sinners, but we've been washed. But what you do with that message that you just heard, what you do personally with the gospel message being preached is of the utmost importance of your life. I wanna be, just encourage you today. Don't be one that just sends this message away. Oh, I've heard you do this a hundred times and I didn't accept it then and I'm not gonna accept. Listen, if you're new here, don't be one that just sends this message of salvation away. Today is the day of salvation. Don't be like Felix where God is meeting with him here today, a special appointment. Why are you here? If you don't know Jesus, why are you here? Because you have a special appointment with Jesus. 
that some person was going to tell you that you can be saved, not of your own good doing or your own good will. Don't just be like, oh man, he's still talking and there's still communion. We're gonna be here all day. Don't be one counting the minutes just to get out of here. Don't be one that's just trying to make the popular and political decision to just appease everyone. You will appease yourself to eternal separation from the Father. You will appease everyone all the way to hell. Rather, I want to encourage you to receive Jesus today. I'm going to ask for every person to have their their heads bowed and their eyes closed. I want to encourage you to receive Jesus Jesus today, right now, I'm calling upon you to be bold. Right now, I'm asking you to make a decision that's going to save your life. I'm going to ask for something that I don't usually do. But I'm going to ask you, if you want to accept Jesus today, that you don't just raise your hand. Because I believe it's important that you confess that you're following Jesus. If you can't stand for Jesus here, it gets really hard out in the world. I'm going to ask you, if you want to accept Jesus, I'm going to ask you that you get out of your chair right now and you come to the front. And listen, if no one comes, no one comes. But I'd never want to give a chance. Never, never want to not give a chance to someone who wants to get their hearts right before the Lord. If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you to be bold in front of all these people to come forward and allow me to pray with you. I'm going to give you a minute. Man, I see you. I see you. I encourage you to come forward. Amen. Amen. This is not the time to be on the fence. It's no time to be appeasing to what people may think. It's no time to care about what anyone else is gonna think of you right now. It's all or nothing. Listen, I've done my part. I've shared this message with you. Now you have to decide what you want to do. Come forward if that's you. Amen, I see you. Amen. Amen. And for the rest of the church, I'm gonna ask you just to extend your hands. We're going to pray for our new brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're going to repeat this prayer after them. And again, there's nothing magical about this prayer. Nothing magical. It's confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that you can't save yourself and you need someone to save you from your sin, to empower you, to give you victory in your life. He didn't just die on the cross to save you from your sin, but to give you power over it through the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will live and reside in you. And so church, what we're going to do is we're going to repeat this prayer after them as well. So everyone up front, repeat this prayer. Lord Jesus, I do believe that you are the Messiah, that you died on the cross in my place that I might live. Lord Jesus, I turn to you today and I want to follow you. Thank you for raising from the dead and giving me new life. Cleanse me of all sin and let me live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm going to ask, yeah, amen. So I'm going to ask you guys that came forward. um, Obviously, we're going to go back to our seats here in a second, but I'm going to ask you guys, if you would, go back to our Connection Center. Tell them your name. We want to get you a Bible. We want to get you things that you guys can do. Get plugged into a church. If you guys are here local, we'd love to have you here. But if you guys came from a different town or a different city, get plugged into a church and continue to grow. Read your Bible and pray every day and do it. Amen? Everyone's here again. So at this time, and that's awesome because there's people that just came to know the Lord. That was awesome. We're going to do communion. We're going to do communion this morning. And for those people that came forward, I want to encourage you to accept communion because you just accepted the new covenant. 
you accepted that it is no longer about bulls and goats and sacrifices. All those sacrifices were, were a covering that was speaking to the time of which you would come forward and accept Jesus Christ, the one true sacrifice that does not cover but takes away the sin of the world. So I'm going to ask everybody, as they pass out the elements, they're going to pass out the bread first, hold on to it, we'll take it together. God bless you. From the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was to be betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And as you hold this, this, this bread in your hands, you can see the holes in it. Jesus says, take this in remembrance of me. So would you take it with me right now? Verse 25 says, In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper and he said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And church, Jesus is coming again. Amen. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, go ahead and hand it out, will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread 
and drink of the cup. As you take this bread and as we took the bread, as you take the cup, we examine our hearts that it's only by Jesus. Nothing you can do to save you. It's only Jesus Christ. And it's by his covenant. And every time we take it, we proclaim he is coming again. Come, Jesus, come. The bride says come. And so we encourage you just to, to take it. Go ahead and put it back in after you're done. This will conclude our service. If you need prayer, I want to encourage you to come forward. I'm going to have Paul uh, come forward up here and pray with people as well. I will be over by the doors if you'd like to talk. And don't, don't leave this room without talking to someone if you need to. Uh, we just want to come alongside you and uh, just be a blessing. And uh, God bless you guys. We'll see you tonight at 7 o'clock up on the football field. God bless you guys. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, your very body began to breathe out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me, Jesus yours is Oh